At the age of 22, Charles Darwin, the naturalist, embarked upon a long voyage of discovery around the world on board the Beagle. At this time, these voyages were real adventures. They had to face the forces of nature, and living conditions on board were quite basic. Darwin suffered terribly from seasickness. Yet his suffering was fully rewarded by the beauty of the landscapes he discovered on other continents. He was filled with wonder and admiration as he took in the richness and diversity of the living world in a tropical forest. Ah, nature is magnificent. Darwin spent a lot of time studying plants and animals. He meticulously made notes of his observations and collected many specimens. How is it possible that all these existing life forms are so diverse and sometimes so similar? Before setting off on this long voyage, Darwin was far-sighted enough to put together a small scientific library as a source of information which he referred to often in order to learn more. An emblematic book proposed a classification system for all species. Animals are classified according to anatomical criteria. Darwin noted that this classification system was not yet coherent. Thus, in the book's first edition, Linné classifies whales within the fish group. But by the 10th edition, whales are classified with the mammals. Female whales do indeed suckle their young, and moreover, unlike the majority of aquatic animals, these giants of the ocean come to the surface to breathe. It is a mammal, after all, whose fish-like morphology is only a result of its aquatic way of life. One could almost say hands and feet. It's quite basic, but in spite of everything, it bears a strong resemblance to lower limbs. Could this be an indication that the ancestors of the whales once lived on land? Passionate about natural history, Darwin became more and more interested in the clues from the past which our Earth holds. During excavations in South America, he discovered a significant number of fossils. He did not recognize some of them, and these were apparently from some extinct species. Other fossils were located in different geological layers and therefore must have existed for long periods. On the other hand, the majority of living species could not be found in the oldest layers. Darwin concluded that the appearance and disappearance of species in very different geological eras appears to indicate that species underwent transformations over the course of time. These changes can also be seen in our own times. In effect, Animal breeders choose individual animals which possess desirable qualities and have them reproduce to successively get animals adapted for their purpose. Thus, a workhorse is visibly different from a racehorse. If this man-made selection can lead to transformations in domestic species, why would this principle not be at work in the natural state? Yet, what could the criteria for natural selection be? Nature gives the impression of inexhaustible abundance, but on a daily basis, every individual animal, irrespective of its species, is constantly fighting for its life. If there is no more food, the survival of the species is under threat. Moreover, a simple calculation demonstrates this. Let's imagine a couple of elephants. We know that this couple can reproduce at the age of 30 and can have six offspring during a lifetime of around 100 years. 
Every generation of this couple's descendants repeats this scenario, and in 750 years, this will result in a population of 19 million living elephants. There's nowhere near this amount, and therefore it's obvious that many elephants die off well before the end of their natural lifespan. Only those with a characteristic which gives them an advantage, such as getting food more easily or eluding their predators, can survive. These variations appear by chance, and nature selects those which are favorable for the surroundings. Thus, through the generations and over long periods of time, a new species which is better adapted to its surroundings may appear. It's an extremely slow process, and the fossils bear witness to this fact. Unfortunately, the geological records are not as complete as I would have liked. Yet, it must be said, fossilization is an extremely rare natural process. Of all the individual beings which lived on the Earth, only a minutely small number died in conditions suitable for fossilization. At least we're fortunate enough to have these remnants which provide us with traces of life on our planet. Darwin returned to England after almost five years' voyage around the world. He started a family and pursued his work on the origin of species. Nature favours characteristics which provide the individual with a survival advantage. And through this natural selection, the variations which represent an advantage in the struggle for existence will impose themselves over the course of generations. The enormous plumage on the peacock's tail is surely not very practical for flying, and it must represent a terrible handicap, as a predator like the tiger will have no problem in seizing this prey. In light of my theory, what possible advantage could this characteristic provide? Oh, Charles, look how beautiful it is. In fact, survival is not the only thing that counts. The individual must manage to pass these characteristics onto the next generation. Apparently, for certain species, this entails a real game of seduction and competition for reproduction. Thus, sexual selection can influence a species' transformation and can lead to characteristics which are not very advantageous to the individual's survival. The more Darwin observed and questioned, the further he advanced in his reasoning. I think that all organisms, living and dead, are related. Every branch of the tree represents a species. Every branching point represents a common ancestry. And following this logic, all the living world has descended from one single ancestor. Darwin's thinking was met with quite a lot of hostility in his time. I don't like your ideas, Charles. Fortunately, however, Darwin was also surrounded by many scientist friends who encouraged him in his research. Charles, you should publish your work. Your exhaustive analysis of fossils and specimens, as well as the correspondence with expert scientists, are at the stage where you can, without a doubt, declare your theory, as you have gathered sufficient conclusive facts. Finally, he published his book on the origin of species in 1859. Since then, new discoveries in diverse scientific disciplines have reinforced the theory of evolution genetics, geology, and especially molecular biology.